Well, welcome back. Well, this is going to be the second run at the bucket income strategy. Apparently, the audio on the first run got uh, dis got uh, something happened with it. You know, technology today. We're all learning this new environment, and either I didn't push a button or something happened on the upload. But in either case, this will be the second run at the at the bucket income strategy. Uh, many of you watched the other one and actually had sent me emails and said it made sense even without the audio. So hopefully this one will, if you haven't watched the other one yet, fill in some of the missing gaps on the one that uh, didn't have the upload or didn't have the audio with it. So welcome back to the bucket income strategy. So let's go ahead and get started. So one of the questions I'm often asked is why do I use this bucket income strategy? You know, people will come up to me and they'll say, well, how do you trade? I said, I don't trade. Uh, you know, it's a gambler's game. And some people will say, well, how do you pick stocks? Well, I don't pick stocks. And after many, many years of seeing what has been happening in the financial industry, and when I first started back in the 1980s, I worked for a very large financial planning firm. And I found a lot of things within the financial system didn't make sense to me and I saw that it was kind of one-sided towards the financial industry. The financial industry tries to as much as they can corral people into a day-to-day -day mentality. I, I even hear it. Um, you know when the market was going up people would call in and they would say I made this much today. No you didn't because you didn't make anything until you saw it. And now when the market drops, I hear people, I lost this much today. This is purely from following the financial media and being, yeah, um, unfortunately, mistrained or, or incorrectly trained because the financial media and the publications and the institutions have done quite a job. So if you're that kind of person, I'm going to hopefully unwind all of that incorrect training. So I see, you know, the financial institutions, I, I'm often asked, well, why do they want that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is media has to fill time. And, you know, when there's a major catastrophe, it's interesting. I can turn on any of the financial news stations. When what, what I like is, is let's say that they're actually reporting. And let's say that what they're saying is, I'm on the courts, I'm on the uh, doorsteps of Congress, there's this big boat going through on taxes, on stimulus. I want to know that. And that's what I turn to financial media for, is that what's happening so that I can start planning out the future for clients. However, when they don't have those big breaking stories, it breaks into this day-to-day. -day. Did you hear what's happening with uh, this stock? And did you see the cruise lines? Did you see this? Did you see that? It's up, it's down, where are we going? And it's interesting to watch the news cycle when they don't have big news. The other reason that I believe that there is so much emphasis on a day-to-day -day mentality is the financial institutions don't really make money when you buy and hold. You're a terrible client or a customer for a financial institution. Why? Well, way back when I first started working back in the 80s, there were stockbrokers and stockbrokers would of course uh, make a lot of money on the trades and then they would split that commission with the brokerage company and back then there was this mentality of hey you know you if you buy a good stock let's hold on to it but today most of the financial institutions have done away with the commissions so you, we saw this you know when TD Ameritrade who was the innovator in online brokerage companies came out in the 90s that pushed down the pressure on the commissions. And now it's been a price game. So Fidelity reduced, well, Fidelity is kind of late to the game, but you know uh, Schwab reduced commissions to zero, then TD followed to zero, and then Fidelity finally followed. So, and, and you have to have certain provisions and certain account balances to get those, those benefits. But when they reduce those commissions down to zero, you have to step back and say, well, wait a minute now. If the brokerage company isn't making a commission, where are they making the money? Well, they're making the money on what we call the spread. And you can look up any stock, and you can look at what the difference between what they call the bid and the ask price is. 
And so when you're using an intermediary, such as a broker, there's a sell side and a buy side. So if you're buying stock, you're buying it from the broker, and then the broker is going to sell it to you at a higher cost than what they're buying it for. Now that might be one-tenth of a cent on each share. If it is a highly uh, traded share, it could be as much as a penny to three pennies to five pennies, every single share. So if you looked at the motivation as to why there is so much misinformation going on, it has to do with how they want you, as the public, to be conditioned. If they can condition you into fear and buying and selling, and you know when the market goes up, they have the fear of missing out. When the market goes down, you have the fear of losing. If that causes transactions. When those transactions happen, the more they happen, the more the financial institutions will make money. And so again, the profit is not in the commissions to the brokers, the profit is in the trades. So the next question you step back and say, well, how do they condition me to make more trades? Well, the higher the risk, the more the volatility. The more the volatility, the more the trading goes on. Again, because they, the financial institutions, in conjunction with financial media, teach the public about missing out on something or potentially losing. You know, way back when this entire crisis happened, uh, I'm referring to the virus crisis, depending upon when you end up listening to this video, there was a hedge fund manager. His name is Bill Ackman. He came out and said that the world is falling apart. The world is falling apart. And everybody started selling because they thought, well, this guy's a genius. Well, what most people didn't know is he had the market shortage, uh, shorted, and he put a $27 million short on the market, which ended up netting him about $4 billion in a total trade. About a $2.5 billion profit is what he walked away with. Now, you wonder, well, why did people follow what he said? Well, because when these big names come out, you'll see that people will do what they say because they don't know any different. What is Warren Buffett going to do tomorrow? What is this hedge fund manager going to do tomorrow? And it's interesting because what I did is I watched the media and as soon as they saw exactly what happened and when the market went back about 15% from its low, all of a sudden every financial news media starts pumping out these articles and interviews primarily with people that are going to say the world is going to come apart, the world is falling apart, we're going into the next depression, the market's going to be cut in half by 50%. These are all late to the party people because they're still trying to maneuver the market so they can control it and make a profit on the volatility. And the financial institutions, they love this. They, they buy into it because there's the volatility that they're making the money on. So whether you go up or you go down, they're making money. It's kind of like what I've said in the past. In, in the 1849 gold rush, the majority of the money was made on the people that sold the gold pans, the wheelbarrows, the picks, the shovels, the blue jeans. It wasn't made by the people mining for gold. And that's kind of where the brokers stand. They make money up or down, per cent per share. So the more you trade, the more you feel like you're missing out, you buy in, and then the more you sell when it goes down, the brokers are making the money. So the higher the risk, the higher the volatility, the higher the trade volume. Now, how does the financial institution do this? Now, do I think that there's this massive conspiracy? No, I don't. But I do know that majority of these financial institutions sit back and they say the more trading, the more volatility, the more volatility, the more trading, the more profit. And so we then have this inaccuracy of how people determine risk. So I'm going to give you an example of that. I'm sure that you have a speedometer in your car. Um, actually, I hope to God you have a speedometer in your car. hope it works. Uh, I've been out on the road lately, and I, I think some people actually don't have a speedometer in their car, but let's assume you have a speedometer in your car. And you're driving down the highway, and the posted speed sign says 65 miles an hour. So what do you occasionally do? Well, if you're like me, you're going to be looking down at your speedometer. Why? Well, number one is it you, you don't want to go over the speed limit and get a ticket. Why? It's too much risk. It's too much expense for the additional time savings. So I use this example. 
So here in Las Vegas, we have what's called the 215. It's a road that goes from Henderson, one side of the town, over to the other side of town, Summerlin. And you can get on that 215 at what we call the Charleston and 215 exit. And it is exactly 19 miles from that Charleston exit to the Eastern and 215 exit, which is in Henderson. So 19 miles. So we know that if, if the posted speed uh, limit is 65 miles per hour, how long will it take you to get to Henderson? Well, we're going to make the assumption that there's no traffic at all. If there's no traffic and you're at 65 miles an hour, you're doing a little bit better than one mile per minute. So it should take you somewhere around 15 minutes, maybe 16 minutes in that range, right, to go those 19 miles. So if I ask the question, if you got on, if you got on the 215 at the Charleston exit, and now what you did is you increased your speed to 100 miles an hour to go to the eastern exit, now how much time will you save? Well, if it's 19 miles, now it's going to take you about, what, 8 minutes, 9 minutes? I'm guessing I'm not doing the calculation, but maybe 8, 9 minutes. And so maybe you'll save 5 to 7 minutes off your drive. So now the question is, what is at risk to make that additional gain? Well, you could drive off the road and kill yourself and at 100 miles an hour. You know, it's funny, I was off that tangent. I was reading this article about uh, during the virus crisis, most of the police are out giving traffic tickets because there's not a lot of crimes going on. And there was an account where a guy in California was doing 180 miles an hour there was another guy somewhere in the Midwest doing 120 miles an hour. And they interviewed this one policeman and they said, you know, uh, what, what, what do you think about the speed? He says, people, they're, they're crazy. They think because they're in a car and they have airbags, if they make a mistake, they're going to live. And he said, you're not driving a NASCAR. You don't have the metal roll bars and the protection and the helmet and everything else. At 100 miles an hour, there's virtually no chance of survival. He said, so I don't understand why people want to take that risk, right? There's no chance for survival. And so when we look at that, we ask ourselves, what is the other risk? Well, you might not just kill yourself. You're, you probably go to jail because you're that much, you're, I think it's 25 miles over the limit. I don't know where it, what it is in every state that you're in, but I know that there's a certain limit where it becomes a crime and they take you to jail. So that could be a big expense and ruin your reputation. Then there's also the, what I always fear, you know, I've always had a fear of, gosh, what would happen if I hit somebody else and you harmed somebody else? And it could be a child, it could be a mother, a father, you could make a child, you know, parent without parents. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a big one, right? So is it really, really worth that risk to save five to seven minutes? Now, most people, if you're not 18 to 20 years old, not that if you're listening to this, I'm assuming that you are a crazy driver, because not everybody is, but the reason car insurance companies charge so much for car insurance is that when you're at that younger age, there is not the risk to reward conductivity, because most of the accidents that happen are, are uh, males between 16 to 18 years old, right? So that is, we know that that's a statistical fact, so it's not just, you know, Ken Himmler's making a judgment on somebody's age. But if you are reasonable, you're not going to say five to seven minutes to put myself and everybody else and that kind of cost at risk is worth it, right? So if you understand that risk to reward, you also understand that you have a way to gauge the amount of risk that you're taking. So you're able to actually make mm -hmm. a, an mm -hmm. actual um, commitment to staying within the speed limit. Now, the problem is, is that the financial institutions don't really have a good way of gauging your risk that you are taking like you would a speedometer. I mean, I look at my speedometer, if it says 65 miles an hour, I know I'm going 65 miles an hour. My question is, do you know, based upon a number, call that number from 0 to 100, do you know how much risk you're really taking? Do you actually... Can you put your finger on that number? Can you say, I'm at a 75 and my portfolio is at a 60. My risk tolerance is 75, my portfolio is at a 60. Uh, I'm way under the amount of risk that I'm willing to take. Well, there's not very, there's not a very good 
system out in the financial institutions to do that. And one of the reasons is, is that they use something that I refer to as a confidence risk questionnaire, not a mathematical risk questionnaire. What do I mean by that? Well, have you ever sat in front of the financial advisor or you know, you call one of these online brokers and they run you through that typical risk questionnaire and they'll say, well, how do you feel about risk? Well, my question is, when are they asking you that? See, you're talking to a guy that's been doing this close to 40 years, 35, 36 years now. I've been through quite a few of these crashes and I've seen how what when a person says, I am willing to do this much risk, but then a financial catastrophe happens and then they're not. And I can liken this to what psychologists call the speed barrier based on risk. So we know from psychologists that when people, and we also know from insurance companies, that when people drive by an accident that has just happened, they will reduce the amount of speed. They will, a rational person, most people, they will be more careful until they become more comfortable with the speed again and they start to forget the accident that happened. And then they slowly increase their risk again until either another event happens or they then, you know, they something happens to them, right? And we know that this is not much different in human psychology than it is with money is it as it relates to speeding in a car, right? Because we know that through every economic boom, people become more comfortable with more risk. Then when there's a recession or a pullback, they actually reduce the amount of risk that they want, which is absolutely the opposite of the way to handle money. So when we handle a car, yes, we always want to keep that risk reduced. But when it comes to money, when everybody's overconfident and everybody's buying in, that's the time you want to get afraid. If it comes down and everybody's afraid, that's the time that you want to build the confidence. So when are they asking you this? Are they asking you during economic growth periods? Is this when they're actually saying how much risk are you willing to take? Um, or are they doing it during recessions and market crashes? Because again, your response is going to be very, very different. What were the lessons we learned from 9-11? Well, it should not be based upon feelings. We knew that when we saw and we visualized those terrorist airplanes hitting the Twin Towers, everybody went into defensive mode. They didn't want to buy anything. They sat back. They were selling, selling, selling because they thought the world was coming apart. Now, if you, most well, I won't say you because I don't know you, but let's say that most people were asked the, the day after that happened, how do you feel about risk? You think you should buy in the market? No, 90% of people said, no, I'm getting out. The world is coming apart. Now, you, you uh, change that to, let's say that in 2005, you asked people about buying into real estate. Oh, everybody wanted to buy into real estate. I was the only guy in the block at a radio show back then, and Oh boy, was I ever criticized because I just said this is insanity. There is absolutely no reason why people should be buying real estate when the rent to price ratio is so far off, right? Well, then it crashes. And how would people have felt in 2019? Well, we didn't know a virus was going to hit. Everybody thought, well, you know, it's always going to go up, so I'm much more comfortable with risk. And then you see, you know, 30% unemployment, and everybody says, oh, maybe I should sell the cash. So again, a confidence questionnaire is not a very good assessment of your risk. What it does in the benefit of the financial institutions is it uses that inaccuracy to lead to more trading, thus more profits for the institutions. Now the institutions are actually teaching the advisors how to do this. Why? Well, you've probably been through this. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, are you a conservative investor? Are you a moderate? Or are you aggressive? I don't know about you, but what the heck does that mean, right? If I asked a 19-year-old um, person and I said, well, tell me if you're you know, mo conservative, moderate, or aggressive, their version of what is conservative is different than what is conservative for a 65-year-old. So how does the financial institutions continually, or why do they continually put people into these three generic benign buckets, right? I mean, it's it, there's no speedometer. It would be like I'm your speedometer having the, you know, a speed sign, 
Conservative, moderate, aggressive. Well, what do you consider moderate? Do you consider moderate 50 and a 35? You get pulled over by the police and you go, look at I had moderate on my speedometer. I was driving moderate. Hey, buddy, the speed limit is 35 and you were doing 50. Sorry, man, you're 15 miles over the speed limit, right? He's using a mathematical means and you're using a conceptual version of, of brackets, right, of, of the generalities. So, you know, it, it, this is, goes into the psychology of how these financial institutions are able to put people into these volatile buckets. And if you think about the psychology of it, it worked for McDonald's. Why not for the financial institutions? Uh, let me explain what I mean by that. You, McDonald's figured out uh, many years ago that they could increase profits substantially by doing what's called an upsell, or in their version, an upsize. And they, start, they started measuring, they had small, medium, and large, and they started measuring, and they figured out that 70, 80% of people would actually buy the medium. Why? So if they asked you, do you want small, medium, or large? So the human brain thinks, well, small, that means I might run out of that. I might, you know, I, I, that's kind of ridiculous, right? Why would I buy a small? I might need to take it with me and I leave, right? But then you think, well, large, well, that's more money and that's a lot. And what if I don't drink it? I'm going to waste it. So what do you think 70, 80% of people would always order? You got it, the medium. Because it's right in between and you're not having to make this critical decision. I know it sounds ridiculous. It's a Coke, right? It's a drink. But this is what they found out. So they also learned that if all they said was, would you like to upsize that for 29 cents? Well, the typical, about 60 to 70% of people would say, sure. So you're taking away the risk because you're putting a, a just a, a number of cents on it, right? Now you're saying, ah, you know, 29 cents, it's not a big deal, right? But making the decision of small, medium, and large. This is what people do with portfolios. They'll look at the average rate of return on the conservative. Oh, that's too small. They'll look at the rate of return on aggressive. Well, I like that more, but that's just way too much risk. I probably should just go right in the middle. And there's this general choice of what a person should do. And the financial institutions really want to focus on the day-to-day. -day. Why? It's minute to minute. Now, think about this. If you're in a medium or you're in a moderate portfolio, you have no conception that that moderate portfolio might actually be aggressive by the institution's standards. So what is moderate to you? Does it mean that the average up or down on that portfolio is 10 to 15%? Does it mean that the average up or down on that portfolio is 20 to 30%? See, the argument can be made that there's this wide gap in what people believe is moderate. If I go back to the 2008 financial meltdown, we know that most stock markets at their lowest time had dropped almost 60%. Now, many people that were in those portfolios were told that they had moderate portfolios. They weren't aggressive. They were told they had moderate portfolios. So is that moderate to you? Well, somebody could argue and say, well, yeah, the aggressive model went down 90%. So I mean, when you don't have a mathematical gauge, it becomes a high risk because mathematically you have to match that portfolio volatility to the amount of cash flow that you need. And the financial institutions love this because if you think the world is sinking, you're going to sell. If you think the world is going on fire, you're going to buy. So they, a lot of times the institutions want to focus day to day. They also want to focus on individual stocks. How do we know this? Look at the TV advertising. Look at all the financial, the financial news networks. And you know, if you're on the left, you're watching CNN. If you're on the right, you're watching Fox, but it doesn't matter. Because all those financial stations, all they're doing is they're pop, popping up some stock research. Well, you, did you know that so-and-so's earnings were this? And look at the price moving on this. And this went up 15% today. Uh, you look at all the stock gurus that sell newsletters and sell all kinds of things about they can predict the future. And I love how in this kind of virus, there's all these gurus that came out and said, so-and-so predicted the meltdown of the virus. Okay, well, first off, I want to see the proof to that. But now what I want to see is over the last 30 years, as they were in the prediction business, how many misses did they have versus maybe one hit? And if, that was, if there was money involved, you know, did they lose nine times and they hit one out of 10 times? Because that's a pretty bad batting average, right? So typically, these people will surface pro, uh, proclaiming that they were gurus and they knew this was happening. Really, well, why didn't they promote this before? 
How come it's afterwards? So then you have the managers. The managers come out with, look what we made from this time to this time. And you know they accentuate it by even popping across stock tickers. You turn on these financial news stations or websites and you know you got the stock tickers going across. So if it's not the person speaking, it's the stock tickers that are just creating that kind of, uh, of risk and, and if human emo it's preying on human emotion. So what's the alternative? Well, I'm going to show you what is a very simple but not popular way to invest money. I'm going to refer back to what's called the Brinson B. Bauer study. You can look this up, just Google it online. And this went, this was back, I think, in 96 and 97. Uh, what Brinson B. Bauer, they were two financial analysts, and they took 81 of the U.S.'s largest pension funds and they tried to determine what made these pension funds successful or not successful. So what they did is they classified the, the management into essentially four categories. The first is asset allocation. I'll explain that in a minute. The second is stock picking, which is pretty simple, like you're trying to find the next Google. The third is market timing. You're trying to predict what's going to happen with the markets. And then the fourth was undetermined. It's a very small percentage, but it might have been options, options trading, etc. Then what they did is they took the pensions and they grouped them into how did they manage money. Then what they did is they took the amount of money that was actually made and then they put it into a return by type of investment strategy. So let's look at what they found out. They found out out of those 81 U.S. pension funds, that of the returns, 91.5% of the portfolio returns were attributable to strategic asset allocation. And I'm going to explain that in a minute because there's a lot of companies that have hatcheted this up and they say they do it. They really don't. They're market timers or stock pickers or tactical um, uh, asset allocators, which is not in alignment with Brinson B. Bauer. There's 4.5% of those returns that were attributable to security selection. You know your chance of actually trying to find the next Google is, you've got a, you, it's about lottery winning uh, returns or, or, or statistics. And then there was only 1.5% of people on that, or in these pension funds. And I, and I want to kind of give you some foundation to this so you understand. We have people that come to us and they say, yeah, we do our own stock research. And we have people that say, well, yeah, I buy 15 different newsletters. And I've done really well. And I always want to break that down and say, well, how long have you been done it for? What is your risk versus your rate of return? Because if you're on a scale of 0 to 100, you're taking a risk of 95, and you pick the best period of time to show what rate of return you've earned, yeah, it's easy to make a rate of return. But let's see what happens at a 95 risk level when the market crashes 30 40%. So, Again, you're looking at the U.S.'s largest pension funds. Now, we're talking about companies that have billions of dollars under their management. That means that they have millions of dollars of research available. They probably have 10 to 30 to 100 people working in a stock and investment research department. So when individuals come to me and they tell me how smart they are and how they've outdone the market and they know the best stock to buy. Look, I, all I can tell you is this. I'm a simple guy. When somebody tells me how smart they are, that they've outgamed the market, I wonder why they don't have a couple billion dollars because that's what they should have. But then I step back and say, look, it's as simple as this. You want to tread in the footsteps of those who have already done it. You don't want to try to say, I'm going to try to do the stock research myself, and I'm going to be able to outwit a pension fund who has a $5 million research budget and 50 people out there walking through companies, talking to the CEOs, reading their 10Ks, reading their annual reports, uh, doing the financial projections, and doing audits on them so they know who to invest into and who not to invest into, versus an individual that picks up some newsletter and says, hey, I think that XYZ is going to take off because John Doe, this guy that sells this guru newsletter, said that this is his prediction. 
Look, it just doesn't make sense, at least to me. And I'm a simple guy. It's simple. Like if I was, you know, if I went into the army, and the army said, "Ken, you got to cross a minefield." Though the first thing I'm going to do is say, "Well, did anybody cross it before me?" And if they said, "Well, yeah, well, great, I'll cross that minefield," all I'm going to do is step in the steps of the guys that didn't get blown up, right? Because I don't want to try to cross the minefield on my own and figure it all out. I just want to find out who did it before me. So this is what this study really shows. It shows that 91.5% of portfolio returns were attributable to strategic asset allocation. So look, if you're if you're an odds player, if you're a gambler, what are you going to do? If you are truly a gambler, go with the odds. Well, the odds are 91.5% that you're going to make more money in strategic allocation than you will trying to find the next Google or trying to time the market. To me, that's pretty simple, right? So why would I try any other strategy? Now, of this statistic, there were 2.5% of the returns that were attributable to other various trading or investing technique. This could be charting, this could be algorithms, this could be options, whatever it might be. But as you can see, the biggest percentage is strategic asset allocation. So imagine, here's what the new media would look like. Can you imagine this? You know, you sit down, you, you, you wake up in the morning and you get your cup of coffee and you turn on the financial news network, whichever you, your preference is. And the, you know, the anchor gets on there and says, okay, it is Tuesday morning and we've got a lot of financial data to cover for you. And let's see, uh, the indexes moved up by a half a percent and nothing broke out of tolerance on your asset allocation. Sorry, uh, we're using strategic asset allocation, so we have nothing else to report on. <laughs> Do you understand? There's, there's no juice, there's no sizzle, there's no electricity, there's nothing to keep you watching. So why would the financial media cover something as boring as strategic asset allocation, even though it works? But they can't sell advertising, <laughs> advertising, right? I'm laughing at myself because I think as ridiculous as that would sound, it would be funny to watch this news anchor and then they go to the old blank screen like they used to do in the 70s or 80s, programming all over. It's a five minute program. And you know, institutions, they're also competing on perceived performance. So there's a couple big money managers out there and they advertise all over the financial news. And clients have come in to us and hired us and they've said, well, this so-and-so company called us and you know, they gave us a pitch that uh, we've got these rates of returns and you know, we have the ex ex uh, excellent management and we can outperform people because you know, we have 20, 30 people. Look, what the bottom line is is this. Warren Buffett, did, and I'll get that in a second, no one can over time beat the market. And since you don't know what that time is, why? it's a loser's game to try to beat the market. So when these money managers say you should hire us because we have superior performance, that's the only thing that they have to hang their hat on. So here's a great example. In 2007, Warren Buffett bet $1 million that an index would outperform a hedge fund industry over 10 years. Now, if you don't know what an index is, I'm going to explain that. That is part of the rest. That's part of the ingredients to the recipe to strategic asset allocation. So, the when he bet the hedge fund industry, there was only the only year that the hedge funds beat the index was in 2008. But in every year thereafter, the indexes beat the hedge funds. Here's the final. Here's the final scoreboard. Warren Buffett returned 7.1% on his index. Keep in mind, all he had to do is rebalance the index over the period of time. No trading, no guessing, no anything. So over that period of time, even with the 2008 downturn for the 10 years from 2007 to 2017, he had a net average rate of return of 7.1. The hedge fund had 2.2%. That's it. See, we all hear these stories about hedge fund manager does this and that. And what most people don't understand is that it's a one shot. It's like a hit and home run. It's like the one home run in your entire career. It's the one hit wonder musician. That's it. It's a lot. It's more of like a lottery mentality. When people say, I, I can pick the next Facebook, the next Google, the next Amazon, your chances of actually doing that are about one in three million. And people will look at the look at the hedge funds, like you know the hedge fund manager that turned 27 million into about two or three million dollar profit. So the question is, hey, look, if market timing doesn't work, 
And we know it doesn't work. People get sucked into it. It's almost like watching this, you know, the 11 o'clock uh, infomercial. And they'll say, buy this health supplement, and within three days, you'll lose 10 pounds. Okay, well, that's kind of scary. I'd want to really know what I'm putting into my body that's going to make me lose three, you know, 10 pounds a day. Am I losing organs here? Or, you know, you always see these um, gym apparatus or, you know, the guy doing the ab crunches, and he's got like 3% body fat, right? And says, within 10 days, you can look like this guy. This guy, I'll tell you a story. This will, this will help you out. So there used to be a commercial on, we, when we lived in LA, there used to be this commercial on, and there's this one fitness model who was on probably three or four of these different um, fitness, um, what do you call it, commercials, infomercials, right? This guy was a professional athlete. He was a professional trainer. When I'd go to the LA Fitness in uh, LA, he'd be there working out, training people. The guy was a constant, like 10 hour a day workout guy. But when you watch the commercial, He's on there, and there's, well, within 10 minutes a day, you'll look like this. Man, the guy was in the gym 10 hours a day, right? So you got to understand that, that there has got to be a better way to do this than trying to buy into the easy, quick way. So I'm going to show you a different way, and it is an easier way than trying to pick stocks and pick the next market movement. And unfortunately, what I'm about to show you, it's really boring. I mean, once you set it up, there's very little to do. And the, you don't have to sit there and read stock research. And you don't have to sit there and figure out, watch all the financial news networks every day. And it's called the bucket strategy. So I'm going to give you some examples here, but let me give you a disclosure real quick. This is only an example. It doesn't make projections, promises, guarantees. I'm not going to suggest any future rate of returns or performance that you can actually make. This is just going to be a simple example. What we're going to do is we're going to create three separate buckets. And in those buckets, we're going to allocate certain types of investments, and these are purely based upon the volatility of those investments. So we're going to break it up into three different time periods. The first one is one to five year period. Next bucket is five to ten. And finally, there is a ten year plus bucket. Now, what does that mean? It means that you have no intention on touching, using, or spending that money that's in one of those buckets. Now in the one to five year bucket, things like money markets, short term bonds, tips and I bonds. Now what is the criteria of these things? How, what are they? What kind of animals are they? Well, they're probably in today's environment, you know, if you're listening to this in 2020, they're probably making anywhere as low as a quarter to half a percent on a money market to maybe two to four percent on a tip or a, a short term bond. However, the characteristic of it is that it has little to no volatility. Now I'm going to move into the five year, five to ten year bucket. We have intermediate term bonds. We have long term bonds. We have insured notes, preferred stock, convertible stock, dividend blue chip stocks. Now these types of inv investments, if you're listening to me in 2020, if you were to ask me for what I would project that they would make, it'd probably be in the five to maybe top end seven percent range. However, Here's what differentiates the five to 10 year bucket to the one to five year bucket. In the five to 10 year bucket, the volatility is going to increase. When I say volatility, what I'm referring to is if I bought a convertible stock for 10 bucks a share, it could go down to, I mean, it could go down to anything so you understand, but the historical go down to is it could go down to about seven bucks a share to eight bucks a share, or it could go up to 11 to $12. So it's got what we call this up-down volatility. And so depending upon what you put into that 5 to 10-year bucket, you're going to probably see volatility in the 10 to 15% range at the top. Now again, but you're not going to touch that money for 5 to 10 years, right? It's going to sit in there. Now in the third bucket, here's where we have stocks. This might be, you know, the Amazons, the Microsofts, the tech stocks, the real estate, the REITs. Uh, these are the private equity covered calls. These will have volatility anywhere on average between 25 to 30 percent. If we look at Mar the end of March 2020 to the beginning of, of April 2020, the average in that bucket went down about 30 percent. Now it recovered quickly within a couple weeks 
and it was only it's only down as of recording here about 15 percent but you can see in that bucket you're going to see a lot lot more volatility but again do we care about the volatility we only care if we're buying into the whole media and financial institution lie of we need to know this day to day that we need to be worried about this day to day if i have a 10-year bucket and my stock goes down 30 percent right now and i don't have to touch it for 10 years i will be completely frank with you i could care less i don't watch it i don't look at it i know what i bought if i buy microsoft i believe it has a good long-term history based on its earnings and based upon its its model if i buy netflix Again, if it drops 30%, I don't care. I, I, I care, on average, if that company stays solid, and meaning they keep their debt structure down, they are selling on the same model. Um, 10 years, I'm going to keep that stock. So what it does in the short term is not that big of a concern. How do we work with these three buckets? Well, let's. I'm going to give you a simple methodology of how you actually structure them. So if I were to take a retired person and let's say as an example they came to me with a million dollars we'll use a round number we may put three hundred thousand in the first bucket two hundred thousand in the second bucket and five hundred thousand in the third bucket now what's important to understand is that if the stock market crashes what bucket does that affect the most it's gonna affect the third bucket the 10 plus bucket so if I have $500,000 in that bucket and the stock market goes down by 50%, well, that $500,000 would go down to $250,000. But as a total of a $1,000,000, I'm down $250,000 or 25% of the million. I'm not down $500,000 or 50% of the million. So there's structural reasons why you do this. Now, the, the question is, how do I determine how much I put into each bucket? Well, there's a mathematical calculation. I'm going to debunk this whole moderate, conservative, you know, aggressive garbage that the financial institutions keep pumping out. There's a mathematical calculation. And that mathematical calculation is how much income do I need to spend, to take out between years one and five? That will determine the amount in the one to five year bucket. Then I can work backwards in to figure out how much do I need to put into the 5 to 10 year bucket so that the, my 20% that I allocated initially will grow back to be my 30% so that when my bucket number one runs out, I can then turn that bucket on to continue for the 10th year. What I, the amount that I allocate to the 10 year bucket is only a leftover after I've calculated bucket one and bucket two. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my payout from bucket number one for the first five years. But while that is paying me, bucket number two is growing as well as bucket number three is growing. Now, when bucket number one runs out, it's going to go away, right, because I spent it. And bucket two now, based upon a rate of return, that 20% is going to grow back to the 30%. Now I'm going to start taking distributions. Essentially, I'm turning bucket number two into my bucket number one. While bucket number two is paying out, what is bucket number three doing? It's sitting there and growing. I don't have to touch any of that for 10 years. So again, when bucket one runs out, bucket two steps into play. When bucket two runs out, bucket three is left over. If I use the rule 72, and that says that over a 10 year period, money doubles at a rate of return of 7.2%. If I use my example of 1 million, whereas I allocate 50%, then in 10 years, I've got my million back. And what am I gonna do? I'm gonna basically just move it all back into my buckets and start the whole process over again. Now, it changes based upon what stage in life you are. If you're in the accumulation stage, then you want to save your money starting and filling up the 10-year bucket. You're not going to start allocating to the 5 to 10 or the 1 to 5-year bucket until you're closer 
to retirement, about five years. However, when you're in the distribution stage, this is when you change from people at work to money at work, what you're going to do is you're going to distribute money from the left to the right, which is, again, spending money from the one year of the first bucket into the second and then into the third. And again, one of the keys is making sure that when you're distributing, you're starting from the first, from the bucket one, which is the one to five year bucket. And just to reiterate again, you want to start converting your bucket strategy about five years before you're going to convert from the accumulation stage to the distribution stage. Now, there are a lot of mistakes that most people make when they don't have the proper system. And one of those mistakes I'm going to refer to as the scraping system. This is where people, and we, we know this happens quite a bit, they'll come to us and they'll say, well, this is how we're taking our income. And what they'll say is, I'm taking my dividends and interest and whatever I have is RMDs, and I'm adding that to my pension and Social Security, that's how I'm getting my income. Let me explain why that is a huge mistake. I'm going to go back to the buckets. We've already established that the one to five year bucket is going to be the least volatile bucket. However, it's also going to be the least rate of return. So we have a lot of times people will come to us and they'll have 100,000, 300,000, 500,000 sitting in the one to five year bucket. I'll say, why do you have that money there? Well, I need it there in case of an emergency. Okay, what kind of emergency could you need that much money? Well, what if I lose a roof? Well, there's 20 grand, your, your insurance covers it. What if I need a new air conditioner? Well, it's 20 grand. You're, you're, you, you might have a home warranty, but if not, it's 20 grand. Well, what if I wreck my car? Well, your deductible is 1,000 bucks. Well, what if I have a major emergency? Well, you have a deductible, right? Everything above that is covered. What is it, 10 grand? With Medicare, it's probably less, right? So the amount of risk that we have today in America is very low as to a cash need, right? However, people will leave money in that one to five year bucket while it's low, uh, volat volatility, but it's also low rate of return. This is what you want to spend first. Why? It is your least efficient bucket. Then I have people that have dividends, and they might have dividends coming out of stock that would fit in the 5 to 10 year bucket or in the 10 year bucket. And I'll say, why are you spending that dividend? Well, it gives me income. Listen, that dividend is making 6%. If we just reinvested the dividend, you're compounding at 6%. Whereas your first bucket is compounding at a quarter to half a percent because of the rate of return that you're earning on that. So why would we spend money, that's good rate of return money, that we could make in six on when we should just be spending the money that we're making the worst rate of return on? That's what's called taking di scraping system. Then we have that don't spend principal strategy. Well, some people will say, well, I was always told, don't spend my principal. No, no, let me rephrase that. You want to spend what is least efficient, the high, uh, the highest, and the highest tax first. Get rid of that money. That's the stuff that's not serving you. You want to uh, hold off and reinvest on those things that have the highest rate of return. Now, what we do for clients is we have everything built out in our software. If you're not a client of ours, you can schedule a 30-minute phone consult and we'll teach you how to simply understand how much mathematically to put into your buckets. And if you're a client of ours and you have not gotten into your software and you're not sure how to recognize how much you have in each bucket, that's just a matter of our planner showing you exactly how to pull up the right reports within your software. So all you have to do is just give us a call. Uh, the planners will walk you through a screen share or the planner's assistants can walk you through a screen share and just show you how to pull that report up to show you how much you have allocated to each bucket. Hey, with that in mind, I hope this makes a lot of sense. This has been one of the most frustrating things for me over 35 years is to see the continuation of the financial media, the financial institutions, all in kind of, it's not technically a conspiracy, but it is in the sense that they provide so much misinformation to confuse people and to lead people down a path of, of emotional stress to sell or buy, creating more profits from them when it doesn't have to be that confusing or that 
uh, much work. So that's hopefully what you got out of this, and I'll look forward to talking to you next time.